Hi everyone, my name is Heather Deal and I'm a fourth year PhD student in cell and molecular biology at Colorado State University. And I am in Jessica Metcalf's lab where we study the microbiome of decomposing cadavers over time as a forensic tool for estimating time since death. And you'll actually be hearing from a lot of us in this workshop. Today I will be giving you just a brief lecture on rarefying, what it is, why we do it, uh, and the consequences as well as some possible alternatives. Okay, so to get in the right mindset, let's first think about some project you might be doing that requires sampling. To keep it simple for now, let's say we're just sampling the color of mice within a community and that we're comparing two samples, sample one and sample two. On the left, we can see what the distribution of colored mice in the community actually has. Uh, we can see that there's maybe like one red mouse, a couple of gray mouse, a few yellow mice, some green mice, and a lot of blue mice. In reality, especially in the microbiome world, we don't really ever know this information, but it's just to kind of show you the nature of this problem. On the right is what we observe when we actually sample. So when we're just looking at part of the entire community that we're trying to make some sort of inference about. If you compare the actual and observed distribution of sample one, we can see there are some big differences. For example, uh, sample one is completely missing the red, gray, and yellow colors. And even further, this blue mouse here looks like it's present two out of three times, so it makes up about two thirds of the community, whereas in the actual distribution, it really only makes up about 50% of the community. When we compare the actual distribution versus observed with sample two, it's a little bit better, but it's not perfect. For example, this gray mouse looks like it's present only one time, but we know in the actual distribution that it should make up about 25% of the sample. So each color mouse in reality represents a specific microbe. So when we're doing our microbiome studies, the actual distribution of microbes within a community that we sample is often pretty different from what we observe based on what comes out of the sequencer. And this means that we can either miss entire species and or misrepresent how much a particular species is there in the actual community. And we can see this in the data. So this is an example of a feature table where we have each sample on the left column, so sample 4, AC2, E375, etc., each feature, and then how many times that feature is present in each sample. We call this a feature table. Now before I tell you what should concern you about this table, I think it would be a really good exercise for you to just pause this video for 30 seconds or maybe a minute and just look at it and think about something that might be wrong and see if you can spot anything. Okay, so hopefully you pause and maybe you notice something important. And that's that different samples have different total frequencies of features. For example, if we look in sample four AC2, the top yellow colored row, there is a total frequency of 358 but if we look at sample 9872 on the bottom, we see that there are only 27 features total. We can refer to this as sampling depth, where we can say that sample 9872 has a relatively low sampling depth compared to the yellow sample for AC2, which has a high sampling depth. Now, um, pause the video one more time and take another moment to think about why this might be a problem. I think this is really good, especially in this virtual format, for you to get as much as you can out of this lecture. Okay, so you should be back from your pause now. Why is it a problem to compare a sample with low sampling depth to one with high sampling depth? Well, the reason, to put it simply, is it's unfair. To explore this more, Let's think about what happens to our sample. So say we swab our microbiome, or however it is you're going to sample your microbiome. Firstly, that sample itself only represents part of the microbial community that we're trying to observe, right? We talked about this a couple minutes ago. Um, and further, um, 
how well that actual distribution is represented within that sample varies between samples and that can make it really hard to make accurate comparisons using those two samples together. Secondly, this frequency and how big or how small it is is actually random. So because of time and money, we can't fully sequence all of the microbes present within our samples uh, as much as we'd like to um, and as much as we'd like for all microbiome labs to have millions of dollars, we can't sequence one sample at a time to get a really high number of reads per sample. So what we do is we combine PCR products of our samples into one pool and sequence them together, which makes it a lot cheaper. And because the sequencing instrument can only sequence so much at a time, the instrument randomly chose to sequence a microbe from this purple sample 27 times, while it randomly chose to sequence a microbe from this yellow sample 358 times. And this makes it really hard to do any valid statistics, including some diversity metrics that can accurately compare these samples. Now, how might we fix this? Well, we can do what's called standardize our samples. And one way to do this is called refaction, where we randomly pick observations without replacement from our samples up to a specific depth. Here we chose 51, which produces a new feature table with a new set of randomly chosen observations from each sample. And what happens when we do this? Well, we lose a lot of information, unfortunately. So let's start with this purple sample. Why did we lose that sample? Well, if you remember from before, there was only a frequency of 27 within that sample, and we can't pull 51 sequences from 27 sequences without replacement. So to keep it fair, we just throw that out. Furthermore, uh, we also lose information even from the samples we did choose to keep. So, for example, in this yellow sample, before we had a frequency of 358, and now uh, we have a total frequency of only 51. So we lose a high percentage of information that was present in that sample. Another thing to think about is that we actually risk losing rare species when we rarify. So let's look at our initial table again. And let's look at feature two in this yellow sample. Initially, uh, it was only present one out of 358 times. And when we choose a sampling depth of 51, the odds of detecting this feature are a lot lower than detecting something like feature four, which is there 198 times. So this information might be pretty overwhelming and you might think, man, this just rarifying really stinks. Um, but it's unfortunately often necessary when we want to do measurements of alpha and beta diversity, which you'll learn about later in this workshop. And I'm sure all of you are super smart and maybe even really interested in this topic. And a good project would be to develop diversity metrics that actually aren't sensitive to total frequency. So throwing away data like this isn't necessarily the case for all studies. Sometimes you can sequence your samples deeply enough that you can pull a lot of information from them and throwing away some data is not that big of a deal. Um, however, th that isn't always the case. And especially if you do a lot of microbiome studies, you will often face these tough decisions when figuring out how to analyze your data. In some cases, there are ways around rarifying. So some analytical techniques don't require it such as differential abundance analysis, as well as some alpha diversity metrics, including richness, which um, you can do in Chime using the plugin called Q2 Breakaway. And if you want to read more about this topic, I have added a reference here with some information about the choice to rarify. And I wanna note that rarifying is actually a pretty hot topic and if you Google it, you'll find a lot of contradicting papers. That in itself is a whole other lecture, but, and, and so we won't really be diving into that much in this workshop. But 
there is a lot of information out there on this topic and if you're serious about microbiome analysis I encourage you to look into this a little bit and kind of decide for yourself what's best. Okay everyone so that was my brief introduction on rarefying. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop.